Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2004 Dibner Library Lecture. I'm Ron Brashear, Head of Special Collections at the Smithsonian Libraries, and the lucky guy in charge of the marvelous rare books and the Dibner Library of the History of Science and Technology. For those of you new to this experience, let me say briefly that the Dibner Library is one of the 20 branches of the Smithsonian Institution Library System. The Dibner Library was established in 1976 with a gift from the Burnley Library of Norwalk, Connecticut, created by the great science book collector, electrical engineer, scholar, philanthropist, and humanitarian, Bern Dibner. The gift provided the Smithsonian Institution with its first rare book library, located here in the National Museum of American History Bering Center. And so Bern Dibner's legacy lives on in this library and in the other libraries and institutes that bear his name. We at the Smithsonian Libraries are especially grateful to the Dibner Fund for supporting research and public activities of the Dibner Library, including the Resident Scholar Program and the annual lecture we will hear tonight, as well as the reception that we'll have afterwards. So if you can please stay around uh, after the talk uh, in the presidential reception suite, um, we'll have an opportunity to talk more and talk with the speaker. Speaking of speakers, it's our great pleasure to have Albert Van Helden as our lecturer tonight. Al started out his professional life as an engineer, getting his bachelor's and master's in engineering from the Stevens Institute of Technology, home of the ducks, in Hoboken, New Jersey. His engineering acumen was quickly recognized by the Ford, Ford Motor Company, who hired him as a metallurgical engineer, a job which kept his attention for all of two years. And he then strayed from the engineering flock and, of all things, got a master's degree in history at the University of Michigan and a PhD in history of science from Imperial College, University of London. With his newly minted PhD, he was off to Houston, Texas, and a job at Rice University. The position at Rice held his attention longer, for 31 years, a bit longer than Ford could do it. It was at Rice that he started the Galileo Project, an online resource about the life work in times of Galileo Galilei. With the collaboration of Adam Thornton and Elizabeth Burr, Van Helden designed the project as a resource to provide students of various disciplinary backgrounds the knowledge necessary to critically examine the original works of Galileo. In 2001, he left to join the faculty of the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, where he is now professor of history of science. Al Van Helden has published numerous articles in the history of early modern astronomy, especially on the history of the telescope and the astronomical research of fellows such as Galileo, Huygens, Cassini, Hevelius, Halley, and many other usual suspects. Some of his more well-known works include the invention of the telescope, measuring the universe, cosmic dimensions from Aristarchus to Halley, of which one reviewer noted, this testimony to the author's profound and ingenious scholarship should be read by every astronomer, every historian of science, and every philosopher of science, and belongs on the required reading list of every student who takes a course in the history of science. So I need to have something like that on my, uh, my resume, too. So uh, very well done. His translation also of Galileo's Siderius Nuncius, or the Sidereal Messenger. And another work I'll mention is a catalog of early telescopes at the Institute and Museum of the History of Science in Florence, Italy. Uh, now today, in honor of the Cassini-Huygens spacecraft that is out studying the planet Saturn, and actually yesterday uh, flew, uh, make its first flyby of Saturn's moon Titan, and some of you may have seen the pictures on the web of that, which we'll continue to do, and the Huygens probe will eventually uh, enter Titan's atmosphere, perhaps in January, I think. So he's, today, though, you get the early part of Saturn's explorations, uh, starting in the 1600s and how astronomers uncovered the mystery of that most unusual planet. Huygens and Cassini both figure prominently in the story, and uh, you'll get a better idea now of why we named the spacecraft after these two scientists. And so I give you Al Van Helden and Huygens Ring, Cassini's division, and Saturn's family, the first explorations of the solar system. First of all, <clears throat> I, I want to thank the uh, Dibner Library for uh, inviting me here. Uh, and uh, 
I, I, can't, uh, I can't get over how, uh, how good that collection is. Uh, I, I didn't realize it, uh, but it is a, a really fine uh, working collection in uh, the history of science. And so I'm very pleased to be invited here, and I thank Ron Bashir and his colleagues. <coughs> Second, a word about engineering. Um, it gets into your blood. It's very important, and I, I, I wrestled myself free from it, and I still go to uh, Engineering Anonymous meetings every <laughs> Tuesday evening. <coughs> but I got captured by the history of astronomy, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful subject for me. Um, it's taken me to wonderful places, um, and uh, now this is a, a, a Saturn year. And <clears throat> we have uh, a Mr. Cassini, you may have a Mr. Uh, ah, I should stop here for a second and talk about how we pronounce that man's name. Huygens. Okay. I claim no particular credit. I happen to be Dutch. <laughs> all right? And it's, it's, uh, you've all heard it. I mean, Dutch is not a language. It's a, it's a throat condition. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in the Anglo-Saxon way, we just call it uh, Huygens, and everybody knows that we're referring to that guy whose name you can't pronounce and whose name is almost as difficult as Leeuwenhoek. <laughs> okay. But who are Huygens and Cassini? And that's what I want to talk about tonight. So I will start, if I get this right. Now, <clears throat> obviously, this is Galileo, and that's where it all started. Telescope comes in 1608. Uh, Galileo turns an improved version to the heavens, starting late in 1609, and by uh, 1610, we uh, have uh, all sorts of discoveries. Uh, Galileo publishes his Sidereus Nuncius, in which he <coughs> uh, really shakes up the world, saying that the moon is not perfect, it has mountains. Uh, I think I jumped ahead of myself a little bit, no, okay. Uh, Jupiter has satellites. Uh, and the sun has sunspots, Venus goes through phases, all these things with new information that had to be digested and that tended to support Copernicus more than it did Aristotle and Ptolemy. Um, but what we usually don't talk about are the three uh, little figures in the back. Uh, on the right, Galileo also was the first one to look at Saturn through a telescope. And in 1610, he saw Saturn as it did in the top. In 1616, he saw it as it did in the, in the center. And there you can already tell it is not just a matter of telescopes because you could easily interpret that as a ring. In fact, when this little figure was found, uh, the person who found it in the Galileo manuscript immediately wrote an article saying that Galileo had deciphered the enigma of Saturn and said that it was sur surrounded by a ring. Uh, it's not true. but. Uh, it, it already gives you an inclination, a uh, hint, that it's not just about telescopes. Okay. <coughs> the observations, then, of Saturn, uh, Galileo left this, this problem for his successors to solve. The, the observations were, um, well, shall we say contradictory? We're talking about they were not very good telescopes. People were working at the very edge of the discriminating power of an imperfect optical system, and they didn't know what they were supposed to see. It's very important to know what you're supposed to see, right? And so we have these sorts of observations. These happen to be by Pierre Gassendi, uh, <clears throat> an astronomer. And the language, if the picture shows something oval, the language is, is usually in terms of a satellite model, that these strange appendages are sort of like, a little bit like satellites, and well, they sort of turn somehow and cause these appearances. As telescopes get better, now we're basically talking about the 40s, we begin to see these sorts of uh, observations of Saturn. And again, you can see that telescopes by this time were clearly able to show the information that would allow you to see a ring. But people weren't seeing a ring. And uh, I want to call particular attention to the one over this one here, because I'll come back to that. It's by a Roman telescope maker named Eustachio Divini. In the 1650s, we started to see 
theories to explain uh, the appearances of Saturn. And uh, the most interesting of these is the one of Christopher Wren. Christopher Wren, uh, who is basically a, a model builder. Wren built a model that shows Saturn as, uh, th that has an, what he called an elliptical corona attached to the body. And that corona sort of librates or rotates uh, around this long axis here. And that causes all the appearances. Now, it's a very ingenious theory, and it's damn near right. Okay. What, what, what Wren said is that the reason we can't see, sometimes that we can't see these handles of Saturn, that it, it appears like, a, like a, just a, a simple, solitary planet, is that that corona is so thin as to be a mere surface. Okay. And in that, in fact, he, as we also see, he was, uh, he improved on, on Huygens. His theory, by the way, came a little bit later than Huygens' theory, but uh, I wanted to, to do it first. Um, and so this is how he accounts for all the appearances of, of Saturn. But, of course, the problem is that if you want to account for all the appearances, such as these here, it can get, it can get very tricky. You have to be able to throw out some, some data in order to make this theory uh, fit, as we shall see. Uh, but this is a tribute to, to Wren. When later on he saw Huygens' theory, he just liked it better. Its elegance spoke to him. And uh, it, he, so this is what he wrote, that he preferred it to his own, even though he felt that his own was as good as Huygens'. He thought that Huygens' was more elegant. So let's get to Huygens. <clears throat> you can see him on the right, cute little boy. Um, that's from the family portrait. Um, and on the left, this is Huygens in his 20s, late 20s. Uh, Huygens started making telescopes um, with his brother, Constantine Huygens, uh, around 1654 right around the time when Saturn was coming into a crucial phase where the handles, as we call them, became thinner and thinner and thinner, and everybody knew they were about to disappear. Well, with his first telescope, Huygens, in March uh, 1655, uh, made this observation. He saw Jupiter with its equatorial belts, and, and, we, and he saw Saturn, and the clue here for him was that these handles, as they were called, or ANSIs, uh, they didn't shrink in this dimension. They kept their length in this dimension. And that was an important clue to him. But it doesn't mean that he saw a ring yet. <clears throat> he published his theory in uh, 1659. Um, and I should back up a little bit. I mean, he, he did, by the way, uh, find a satellite of Saturn, the first satellite of Saturn, the one we now call Titan. And uh, it, that's what got him really stuck in to the problem of Saturn. And then he solved the problem, and he published it in 1659. This is his solution. He had given an anagram uh, that he had published. And an anagram, in other words, the solution is hidden in these letters. And here he gives the solution. Uh, that is this, uh, anulo kingitur tenui plano nusquam coherenta ad eclipticum inclinato. It's surrounded by a thin flat ring which touches it nowhere and is inclined to the ecliptic. <clears throat> and so this is Huygens' solution to the problem which he publishes in 1659. Now, this is a, a brilliant di diagram in which he shows how a ring uh, can account for all the appearances that up to that point uh, had been observed, with a few exceptions. This is a drawing that he made in 1658. I mean, Huygens is now clearly seeing a ring, obviously. This is in the, how it looks in the published version, which, by the way, uh, Systema Saturnium, there's a copy in the uh, Dibner Library. <clears throat> and I need to stand still at this particular figure. 
uh, Huygens had gathered uh, through correspondence uh, as many observations by others of Saturn as could be found. And he had classified all these. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, this is how Galileo saw it. Uh, <clears throat> this, uh, <laughs> well, these are, are you know, pretty interesting. Uh, this is how Mr. Hevelius, his colleague, uh, observed it. Uh, here we obviously have obvious <laughs> optical problems. <clears throat> but now, what Huygens had to do was he had to, exp he had to sort of reject these sorts of appearances. And if the central body was sort of oval like this or sort of like that, then he had to reject those. He had to say to other observers, look, I mean, these observations are wrong. But the question is, he is now uh, in his late 20s. Where does he get the authority to make those judgments? And he bases his authority on the fact that he had discovered the satellite of Saturn and that therefore his telescopes must be better. Now, that was not accepted by everyone involved. Um, and in fact, remember this one? Well, <clears throat> Mr. Davini, who was Europe's foremost telescope maker at this time, operating in Rome, uh, and obviously you can see he has no ego problem. Uh, <laughs> The engraver of that figure, which is part of a, a larger figure, but the engraver of that figure had added, like a good artist does, shadow effects. They happened to be dead wrong. And that's what Huygens uh, criticized Davini for. Well, Davini uh, got together with uh, a, uh, a Jesuit scientist named Honoré Fabri, and they published together uh, a book, a little book against Huygens, in which uh, Fabry came up with a very strange sort of complicated satellite model that was supposed to explain these appearances of Saturn. And Huygens had uh, dedicated his book to Prince Leopold de Medici, uh, of the great Medici family, the patrons of science, you know, whose father had been uh, the patron of Galileo. And so Divini and Fabri, in their book, they dedicated it too to Prince Leopold de Medici. What was a prince supposed to do? On the one hand, he gets an elegant theory from a Calvinist, heretic, Copernican. On the other hand, he gets a horrible theory from a powerful Jesuit in Rome who believes the earth is the center of the universe. That's what you do. You make models. And you have lots of people observe these models with the naked eye, with little telescopes, with big telescopes from various distances. And the Prince's Academy, the Academia del Cimento, in other words, the Academy of Experiment, uh, and the experimentation, of course, was the way to go in Italy after Galileo. No hypotheses, let nature speak. Uh, so this academy looked at this model, and they looked at Saturn as well, uh, and uh, they said that Huygens' model was far superior uh, to Fabry's model, um, but that no matter what they did, they couldn't make the ring so thin that when you look at it edgewise, it's invisible. There's always a little bit of something that you could never make, they could never make it invisible. Huygens believed that the ring was a solid structure, that it had a certain thickness. And he thought that for the rest of his life, he could never be, he could never be uh, swayed from that, even though uh, his colleagues, by and large, sort of uh, arrived independently at the opinion of Christopher Wren that the ring was just simply so thin as to be a mere surface, okay? a mere, in other words, just a two-dimensional thing. Um, Huygens won this battle. Uh, people liked, obviously, liked his ring hypothesis, with that exception. Uh, the ring hypothesis had to be tweaked a little bit uh, because the 
inclination of the ring and things like that you know, had to be adjusted. But the solution uh, was, was there, Huygens had given it. And very quickly, people began to see a ring. In fact, people, this is now a few years later uh, in Rome, uh, people who say that even that if, if they, like this man Fabry, after a while said, I still don't believe it, but I can't help seeing a ring. <laughs> so, uh, and so it's an in interesting uh, sort of cognitive story here. Uh, the ring, in fact, started to have some, uh, I just want to go back a little bit, to uh, started having some, well, people started seeing, uh, they started seeing shadow effects. Okay, this, in this case, it's the shadow of the body on the ring. And in this case, uh, it is as well. But this turns out to be uh, actually a, a thinner ring, which wasn't discovered until 1848. Uh, and they were, they were seeing the effects of, of that. They thought it was a shadow, but in fact, it's not. Already? Uh, the ring is being differentiated here in, in, the, in 1664. Uh, the the out, outer part is darker than the inner part of the ring. Uh, and there we are. This Mr. Campani, who is a great telescope maker, um, and who, in fact, uh, in so-called paragoni, that is head-to-head -head battles with telescopes. This is battling telescopes against this Mr. Divini, defeats him handsomely. Campani is the best telescope maker in Europe, and Huygens already in 1664 knows it. He has seen a Campani telescope, and he says, I can't compete with that. Um, and Campani is the man who, uh, well, he's just the man in the second half of the 17th century. This is a period when telescopes get very long, uh, this is uh, by Mr. Hevelius. I call your attention again to the fact that uh, we got this out of a book in the Dibner Library, uh, the uh, Machina Celestis uh, of Hevelius, the Celestial Machines, that was published in 1673. And here you see, let's just call it this sort of epitome of a long telescope. I mean, it's for optical, for, for optical reasons that you have to make them that long. You have to keep the curvature to a minimum, and you want to increase the magnification, and that just simply means that you have to make longer telescopes, and it becomes longer and longer and longer. But at this point, you can no longer call it a research uh, telescope. Uh, this is basically a, uh, yeah, a, a piece to, uh, to impress people. You can't really make serious observations with a thing like this anymore. But that's how far they went in the 17th century. So now, let's get to Cassini. You notice that I've put his name in two different ways, and I've given two different sets of dates. In contrast to Huygens, who is a kind of a universal theor uh, theoretical, but also practical person who does lots of things that are crucially important and to which I will return later, Cassini <coughs> is a very practical, practicing astronomer and a brilliant courtier. Cassini uh, is a professor of astronomy in Bologna. He is uh, the, uh, the person who is in charge of uh, certain fortifications for the Pope. Bologna is part of the, the Bologna is ruled by the Pope. Um, and he is also in charge of um, settling problems with water uh, in Italy, in the Po Valley. Uh, there are a lot of problems about part partitioning of water, who can have this water, which direction does a river, should a river flow in. I mean, it's, uh, and there is a lot of very important literature that comes out of that period about flood control of rivers and stuff like that. Cassini is kind of a, a universal uh, astronomer and, and, and surveyor. And he works with telescopes made by this man, Campani. This is a Campani telescope of, of about two and a half meters. Uh, 
as opposed to this Davini telescope, which is about five meters. But I just wanted to give you a, uh, a look at, at uh, some of these telescopes, the way they have uh, survived. <coughs> and it was with Campani telescopes that Cassini began to make uh, a series of uh, very important uh, observations. But first, as a professor of astronomy in Bologna, Cassini turned the Cathedral of San Petronio into an astronomical instrument. And that is, in one of the side aisles, uh, there was a, basically a pinhole, in other words, an aperture of about an inch or two. Um, and through this, the image of the sun comes across, is, is cast on the floor of the cathedral. And so if today you go to the Cathedral of San Petronio in, uh, in Bologna, uh, you, the aperture is here somewhere, and uh, the meridian line is here. It's, it's, it just about fits between these pillars. And here's the image of the sun as it sweeps across at noon. It, it, it's right on this meridian line. <coughs> now, the fact is you can make surprisingly good measurements with this. And with this, Cassini convinced himself that there was a two-minute discrepancy in the obliquity of the ecliptic. Now you say, what's two minutes? Uh, but if you get the inclination of the Earth's axis to its orbital plane wrong by two minutes, that means that that error gets multiplied into the theories and calculations of all the planets. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a, it's a crucial piece of, of work. Cassini, in the realm of technical astronomy, did very, very important work. But there is more to it as well. <coughs> With Campani telescopes, he uh, figured out the rotation rate of Jupiter over about 10, 10 hours. It turns on its axis in about 10 hours. Uh, a year later, he publishes the same for Mars. Okay. Uh, its rotation period is about 24 hours. Um, Huygens had made these observations, but he hadn't published them. Um, and from Huygens' observations, we can uh, derive the same sort of rotation period. Um, but you, you can begin to see that Huygens and Cassini uh, are uh, working on some areas, uh, the same, in some cases, in the same, er on the same area. And uh, I don't think that their relationship uh, ended up being all that happy, as we will see. Cassini, in 1668, published a set of tables for the satellites of Jupiter. Now, the satellites of Jupiter uh, were important. Galileo had already seen it because, uh, and, uh, uh, okay, I think that, <laughs> first I'll pursue, sorry about that. First I'll pursue the, uh, uh, his, uh, his competition with Huygens a little bit. In 1671, Cassini found a uh, satellite of Saturn, the one we now call Iapetus. Um, and this is a letter by him in which he uh, tells uh, a fellow astronomer, Picard, uh, that he has found the satellite. This is a uh, page of his observations. In 1672, he found yet another satellite. So now, Cassini has uh, found two satellites, Huygens one. Huygens has solved the problem of, uh, of the ring, um, but as we shall see, Cassini sort of hijacks Saturn from Huygens. This is, Cassini has moved in the meantime from Bologna to Paris, a very complicated move, because the most Christian king, Louis XIV, uh, told the Pope that he needed Cassini for some time. Cassini ended up in Paris where he became basically the director of the Paris Observatory and he spent the rest of his life there and hence in his Italian part he's called Gian Domenico Cassini. In his French part he's called uh, Jean Dominique uh, Cassini. And so the Italians don't really claim him and the French of course don't claim him. And so there has not been a really good biography of, of Cassini, although that is beginning to change now. Um, anyway, here we are, 1673, uh, Cassini publishes 
uh, this little book on, or this little article on this is the new satellite that he found in 1671. This is Huygens' satellite and this is the new one that he found in 1672. That is the satellite that we now call Rhea. Cassini organized the new French observatory uh, in a terrific way. There was an expedition that was sent to South America in order to check whether Tycho Brahe, the great ob observational astronomer, had made a mistake in the obliquity of the ecliptic, which turned out to be the case. Um, Cassini sent Jean Picard to the uh, observatory of Tycho Brahe to make measurements uh, and so that uh, th they had Tycho's uh, observations, but they needed to know the latitude and especially longitude difference between the Paris Observatory and Tycho's observatory. And that's why uh, Picard was in Denmark. While he was there, uh, he and Cassini exchanged observations of Jupiter's satellites of which Cassini had made these tables, has published these tables in, in 1668. Now, it is the emergence of these satellites in the shadow of Jupiter. Here's the Sun, here's Jupiter, here's the Earth, here's Saturn, here's Venus, here's Mercury. I think I've forgotten Mars, but it's lost in space somewhere there. Anyway. <laughs> The shadow cone made by Jupiter when the first satellite, uh, that's the inner one here, enters that shadow cone, it winks out. And no matter where you are on Earth, that's an instantaneous event. Here are all these people with telescopes on Earth making these observations. So it's a clock. Okay. And if that event happened here at a certain time, say 10.15, and it happened, uh, you know, somewhere, somewhere else on Earth at a slightly, uh, well, at a different local time, then that difference would be a function of the distance between them, okay? To the point that, of course, 360 degrees equals 24 hours. Okay? And so the time difference immediately gives you the longitude difference. Longitude is the big problem uh, in the 17th and 18th century. Latitude is easy. Longitude is a national problem for which most countries have a prize if you can solve it. But what we, we know about this story, uh, for instance, through Davos Sobel's book on, the, on longitude and, and Harrison and his chronometer, but what we don't usually think about is how maps were affected by the satellites of Jupiter. Longitude differences between places could now be determined all of a sudden much more accurately. When Europeans started uh, doing serious astronomy, mathematical astronomy, uh, I'm sorry, geography, at the end of the 15th century, they had the length of the Mediterranean wrong by something like approaching 20 degrees. In other words, the order of 1,500 miles or something like that. Uh, and these errors, obviously gradually became less and less and less. But the true revolution, in other words, accurate ge geodesy was invented by Cassini. Cassini and his people went everywhere in France and uh, took the latitude and longitude of places. And for instance, it turned out that the difference between Paris and Lyon was off by 10%. Right? In other words, 30 miles. I mean, it's not an insignificant order. Cassini ended up uh, then publishing an, an outline map in about 1680 in which he showed the coastlines of France compared to the best maps that were available. Okay. And so here you see that uh, the point, uh, you know, the, the, the western point here has been moved back. That distance is a degree. We're talking about 60 miles. Here, the difference is between 30 minutes and a degree. <clears throat> Louis XIV sees this map and, uh, and if this is not true, it ought to be, says, look, <laughs> I'm losing more territory to my astronomers than to my enemies. <laughs> uh, 
Huygens first came to the academy uh, that Louis XIV had founded, the Academy, the Academy Royale de Sciences, uh, in 1666. Cassini joined him in 1669. Uh, the two, from time to time, worked together. This is an observation they made together around 1675. But basically, Huygens uh, felt that Cassini was one of those people who every time, I mean, he was at, at the telescope and his measuring instruments every night. And Huygens said, I, I wouldn't want to be tied down to that. And he sort of makes light a little bit of Cassini's discoveries by saying, you know, my satellite is the best satellite and, you know, I wouldn't want to be a slave to my telescope and make these observations all the time. In other words, a certain amount of petulance. They're very different characters. <coughs> In 1676, Cassini has already published <coughs> the famous gap, Cassini's division, between the outer ring, which is darker, the outer part of the ring, and the inner part of the ring, there is a division. We call it Cassini's division. <clears throat> Notice also, Cassini's a little bit older here. Okay. The telescope is still important, but it's the observatory that features more prominently than the telescope here. Cassini is the director of the observatory. He owns this place, and <clears throat> he he establishes a rule over that lasts for a very long time, that lasts until the French Revolution. And so you get the feeling that when it comes to astronomy, Huygens is being squeezed out a little bit by Cassini. Cassini, by the way, uh, ends up uh, finding two more satellites of Saturn, and the king actually strikes a medal celebrating Saturn and its satellites. Okay. No names are mentioned there, but it's clear that, you know, it's Cassini who gets the credit. And so we are left with Cassini, <coughs> the patriarch. Cassini lived to a, a very long age. Here he's seen uh, in the 1690s uh, when he makes a, at the time he makes a triumphal tour back to uh, Italy where they sort of recalibrate the great meridian in the temple in the, in the church of San Petronio. Okay. Cassini has one son, Jacques Cassini, who, who follows him as the director of the observatory. And then <coughs> his grandson, César François Cassini, uh, who becomes Cassini de Turi, in other words, member of the nobility, is the third Cassini, who is the director, and then the final one is Cassini IV, uh, who is uh, called uh, Jean-Dominique Cassini again. And he uh, is kicked out of the observatory during the French Revolution. So Cassini's run the Paris Observatory from about 1670 to about 1790. Okay. Fairly successful run, you would say. What about, what about Huygens? <coughs> Well, Huygens, of course, has his own achievements that, uh, that he can be proud of. Huygens, uh, in 1657, while he was busy on the problem of Saturn, was the first to successfully apply a pendulum as a regulator to a clock. He published a little book on it called Horologium. Uh, but it's not just, uh, you know, he was a man who had good ideas and got... Uh, although he made his own lenses, he didn't make his own clocks, but he told clockmakers what to do. Uh, and he realized that a, a pendulum, especially when it has a large swing, uh, is not truly isochronous. He figured out that you needed to put these little, well, we usually refer to them as cheeks, that this, this cord wraps around so that the pendulum, uh, Bob, is not that the path it describes is not a circle, but is, uh, in fact, a cycloid. And uh, he analyzed this all mathematically. He was one of the great mathematicians of the 17th century. And, in fact, he went on. And here he's shown at basically the height of his power in 1673 when <coughs> he published his great book, Horologium Oscillatorium, the pendulum clock, 
in which, which is full of, of a very important sort of mathematical physics in the area of mechanics. For instance, if an object is swinging around in a circle, what is the acceleration of it? It's, you find it in that book. That book, by the way, is dedicated to Louis XIV, who at that particular time was at war with the Netherlands. So Hoyens has uh, some problems there. And <coughs> it's difficult. He's also a Protestant. And Louis XIV is not happy with <coughs> the Protestants in, in France that have been given uh, a certain amount of religious freedom by the Edict of Nantes, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, pronounced in uh, 1589 uh, in order to get uh, you know, the French, the first Bourbon king uh, on, the, on the throne, Henri of Navarre. But in 1685, uh, Louis XIV, uh, in fact, abolished the Edict of Nantes, and all the Protestants had to get out of France. Now, Huygens was already gone in 1671, and again in 1675, and again in 1681, or thereabouts. <coughs> he got very sick. And if we read uh, about this sickness, uh, it's, it's, of course, impossible to tell. It's, it's a weakness. Uh, and it is a, he, he can't work. And at one, one point it says that a servant has to carry him out of bed. But they don't say that he has something wrong with his stomach or that he is lame or anything like that. And so uh, it appears to me, um, but I'm not a physician, but maybe that's why I can talk like this. It appears to me that he suffers from very severe bouts of depression. And, in the last, it's, and he always goes back then to The Hague, his hometown, in order to recover in the bosom of his family. Um, but the, after the one in 1681, it lands on, it takes him a year, a year and a half to recover, and he's getting noises from Paris that, well, maybe he shouldn't come back, maybe don't come back yet, and pretty soon it's permanent, that he's no longer wanted. And that's around the time when the Edict of Nantes is repealed. Huygens makes telescopes again. The satellites that are discovered by Cassini in 1684, when Huygens is already back in The Hague, he can never see. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's even more of an insult. He can't make telescopes good enough in The Hague to see the satellites that Cassini has discovered in Paris with telescopes made by Campani. But then again, Huygens made some very famous discoveries in optics. His Traité de la Lumière of 1690 is, uh, well, it, is, it, is, it, it shows the world for the first time how to construct a wave front uh, by assuming that from every point in, in the beam uh, you draw little waves. From this point you draw a little wave, from that point you draw, and you add these up, and this becomes then the wave front. This is a crucial geometric uh, construction that lies at the basis of the wave theory of light, which, by the way, only comes about in about 100 years later, in, in, the, in the beginning of the 19th century. Um, but it's still very often called the Huygens principle, and he's generally recognized as uh, sort of the, the forefather of the, of the wave theory of light. At the end of his life, he also publishes a cosmological book. It's speculative. I mean, he can talk about inhabitants of other planets and things like that. And so uh, he finishes this book. Uh, it is published posthumously in 1698, because he dies in 1695. Uh, and in it, uh, we find, uh, for the first time, an emerging picture of sizes and distances of the solar system. It's during the generation of Huygens, and as a large part also because of some of the measurements that Huygens have made, that people begin to figure out just how big the solar system is and just how big the bodies in it are. And so here he takes the sun as his, as his, as his reference point uh, and shows the size of Jupiter with respect to it, the size of Saturn, and you know, Venus, Mercury, the Earth, and the Moon. <coughs> uh, 
But he still believes that that ring of Saturn is a thick ring. He never lets go of that. You see here the Earth and the Moon compared in size to Saturn. Now it's a fact that Saturn's ring is an important conceptual uh, thing in cosmology. In the middle of the 18th century, Thomas Wright of Durham uh, published his book uh, on an original theory and new hypothesis of the universe in which one way, uh, the alternative model as he calls it, he says it's, you know, that, this, that the fixed stars are arranged around some center in disks like so. Okay? And clearly, the ring of Saturn, or the rings of Saturn, as people are beginning to call them now, are the model for that. From right, Immanuel Kant picks it up. Uh, and we get, for the first time, an evolutionary hypothesis of how the universe has come about uh, by Immanuel Kant in the 1750s. Uh, and others pick it up as well. And of course, uh, the famous uh, one uh, is Laplace, who uh, 50 years later, around 1800, publishes uh, his nebular hypothesis, uh, which is an evolutionary model of how the solar system and how the universe came about. And it is, of course, then uh, the famous uh, statement, which again, if it's not true, it ought to be, that when Napoleon asked him, uh, tell me, uh, tell me, Marquis, where, where does God fit into this? He, he's supposed to have said, uh, sire, I don't need that hypothesis. Um, so, Cassini and Huygens are not exactly kindred souls. They're very different personalities, uh, and uh, their, their success uh, are in, in, in different areas. But I want to end with a, a little... We call these things Titan, and we say that Cassini discovered Rhea. Where do we get these names? At the end of the 17th century, Saturn has five moons. Jupiter had four. And so you just named them one, two, three, and four, you know, going uh, away from the planet. But then, in the 1780s, William Herschel discovers two more. And now, we, if, we, if the planet is here, we number them seven, six, one, two, three, four, five. Well, that's kind of a mess. And here, of course, we have numbered them uh, in the order uh, of of, the, of uh, their distance from the planet, but shouldn't we perhaps order them by the date of their discovery in which it would be uh, one, two, three, four, five. In 1848, there's yet another satellite uh, found, and uh, that takes its place here. So now we have this strange sequence. Well, you can't do business that way, obviously. You need to find a way uh, to do this. And so then we get William Herschel's son, John Herschel, in 1847 writing this, that uh, it is the, uh, I see I've made a mistake here, uh, that uh, he, uh, he uses mythological name, uh, names, and it's his authority that makes it stick. I mean, today the International Astronomical Union has committees for that sort of stuff, uh, but here it is the authority of John Herschel, who is perhaps the most authoritative scientist in Britain at the time. Uh, and that's where we get these names. So these names date from the 1850s, or roughly, okay, because they were very quickly adopted. Um, but in the 17th century, they just called them, you know, the Huygenian satellite or the innermost satellite or one, two, three, four. And the same thing with the satellites of Jupiter, which, by the way, we, as you know, we call Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Those names were basically not used by astronomers until about the turn of the 20th century. Why? Because the fifth satellite of, sat of Jupiter was discovered in, uh, I believe, 1895, and that gave a similar problem to this. And since then, we have used these names. Anyway, so now I hope that I have enlightened you a little bit uh, about who Huygens and Cassini were, uh, what their long suits were, and what their short suits were. So thank you very much. Okay.
we have a few minutes for some questions in case you'd uh, like to uh, do that. Uh, we have, because we're taping this, uh, I bet you didn't know we were doing that, we're taping this uh, oh, lecture. No. Oh, oh, yeah, no. that, that's right, hide your face. I'm on record. We'll have a blue spot over your face. Um, we do have some microphones in case uh, you want to, uh, you know, speak into them or, or maybe we can have somebody uh, pass them out to you or if you want to uh, walk up, but, you know, just sort of uh, raise your hand and maybe somebody can come around to you and, and, and pass the uh, microphone to you. I see David's already ready to go, so um, let's start with that. I'm, uh, I'm worried. Would you say a few uh, words about uh, uh, standards of uh, visual representation uh, in, let's say, the first century or the first 50 years of using the telescope? All those marvelous images of Saturn uh, that you showed uh, seem to have a lot of stylistic characteristics to them as well. Um, and uh, it just sort of uh, came to mind that uh, uh, you indicated that models were the way to interpret uh, what was seen through the telescope, or at least they chose it in the case of the rings, but uh, were there any standards? Were there any standards? Well, the obvious place to look is the moon, uh, which you, uh, if you want to represent the moon, then you need conventions. Uh, for instance, I mean, we don't realize that, but when we look, basically when we look at a moon map or a, a, a drawing that represents the moon, we see the craters neatly outlined. But if we, if we look at it, the shadow effect is in fact impossible on half the moon because by standard we use uh, evening illumination uh, and so that the shadows are, uh, are come from a certain direction over the whole moon, which is impossible and, 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 and stuff like that. Uh, what, what, I, what I see in astronomy in the first half of the 17th century is a move from, uh, from words to pictures. The telescope means that you have to use pictures, but in the, 16, in the 1640s, uh, I had one there from, uh, uh, called Detectio Dioptrica of 1643, that showed that picture of Saturn. He, that guy has a picture of Mars in which it is sh sort of shown like an Abbevillian hand axe, sort of a triangular piece of stone, right? And it has the, it has the mark, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The uh, astrological mark of, of Mars on it, okay? So that makes it Mars, right? Uh, that's still the old sort of word way of doing, of doing things. Uh, that goes out in the course that in 1643 is already fairly late, but that, that goes out. Uh, some people are better drawers, other people are not. But if you get something engraved, then you always blame the engraver, <laughs> right? And so that's what Robert Hooke does in his micrographia and stuff like that. Whereas the astronomer Hevelius makes his own observations, makes his own drawings, does his own engraving, and then does his own printing. Right? And so that it, that's a case of where, since Hevelius did everything, when you read his book, it's as though you were with him at the eyepiece of the telescope. Right? So, and he says that, uh, you know, um, if, you, if you use an artist to draw, they'll get it wrong and they'll eat you out of house and home because you've got to put them up and you've got to pay them and stuff like that. And so it's, it's this wonderful sort of frugal sort of uh, northern, northern thing. So, um, but the quality of the illustrations depends a lot on, on, uh, on, on the person involved. Huygens is, uh, you, saw, you saw them, you saw what the, the fantastic stuff that Campani publishes, you know, so, okay. Yeah. I believe that it was uh, Huygens that used an anagram when he published yes. his first, why did he do that? What, what was mm. that about? Uh, there were, that's where there were no standards in the 17th century. Uh, and it was a, it's basically a politi political game in which reputations are very important. And so that if you discover something and you tell me, I say, oh, I discovered that the day before yesterday. Now, how do you decide who has priority and therefore the credit? And um, Galileo used anagrams in a couple of cases. And Huygens is a great admirer of Galileo, and in fact, his work uh, 
sort of fits into, it seems like a continuation of Galileo's work in falling bodies and, you know, the pendulum and all, all these kinds of things. So he uses them. But the funny thing is that you also have to so have some rules about anagrams. For instance, if you, if you give somebody an anagram that's got 350 letters in it, right, you can always later on, you know, if you play with it long enough, get it to say anything you want. Uh, and so you need an anagram with, say, 40 letters or 50 letters or 30 letters or something like that. Uh, so Huygens discovers a satellite. This is the first anagram he uses, and he just sends it to a couple of people. In England, uh, he gets a, an anagram back with a lot of letters in it, about 125, from a mathematician called John Wallace, who is associated with Christopher Wren. They were looking at Saturn, too. And he figured there was something about Saturn, and uh, so he sent this anagram. Then later on, when Huygens writes Wallace, well, this is the solution to the anagram. I have found a satellite that goes around in 16 days. Wallace sends an anagram back that is also about, uh, a, you know, a, a solution, sorry, to his anagram that is also about Saturn. It's also about a satellite. And then he admits later on that, I mean, within a few months, uh, he admits that it was a hoax, that he cheated. But he says he did it to show to Huygens that anagrams are not reliable. So, so it's about priority. I'm sorry, you ask me what time it is, I tell you how to make a clock. <laughs> so, so. Uh, would you, pl uh, thank you for your talk. Would you please uh, uh, say a few words about the type of telescopes they were using? And I couldn't tell from your diagrams whether any of them reflector, and if not, when did reflector telescopes come into use? Thank mm. you. Now, they're refractors. And uh, they begin in, uh, at the time of Galileo with uh, Galilean telescopes, in other words, a concave eyepiece, uh, which is a hideously difficult instrument to use. Uh, then they switch to uh, convex eyepieces. In about the 1640s, they, they begin with that. Uh, but whereas the concave eyepiece does do a little bit of correcting for defects in the objective, the convex eyepiece does not do that. So the standards for telescope making of lens grinding have to go up. Um, it's at that time, too, that they begin to use compound eyepieces. And Huygens has his own version of that. Uh, Campani has his version of, it, of that. Uh, and, but because it's a race, discovery, you know, gives you great credit, better telescope leads to discovery, so they get longer and longer and longer. Uh, that point, I mean, by the 1680s, um, th these telescopes have reached their practical limit. Beyond that, they're white elephants. They even get rid of the tubes and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Now, in the meantime, Isaac Newton has made a little reflecting telescope. People have been doing the math of reflecting telescopes uh, on a number of you know, various publications you can find that, but Newton actually makes one, uh, and it works. And it's, it's a, it has about an 8-inch tube. It's, a, it's an F10 Newtonian. And uh, it's an aperture of about inch, inch and a half or something like that. And with it, you can see the satellites of Jupiter. And everybody sort of thinks, Jesus, this is terrific. But it doesn't lead to immediately reflecting telescopes taking over. Uh, the mirror tarnishes. You have to keep refiguring it and you know, all this kind of stuff. And for the time being, uh, the refractor in 1670, 80 is still you know, you can still get more out of that. And it's only when, uh, when, the, when the refracting telescope reaches a point where you just don't take it out every night uh, that there is kind of a, a hiatus around 1700. And so, for instance, the English, uh, at a certain point around 1710, say to the French, and this is now the son of Cassini, look, we don't believe that these, the fourth and the fifth satellites exist. And so Jacques Cassini has to get one of those things out of the mothballs and do a bunch of